The views and opinions expressed by contributors on the Spoon River Gothic podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the host. Material heard on the Spoon River Gothic podcast is intended for adult listeners. This podcast deals with mature topics that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide. Chapter 48, A Reasonable Doubt After the noon recess, the jury is returned to the courtroom and the following proceedings were had. The court, please be seated. Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The court, Mr. Bull. It has been a long and tiring case for anyone, ladies and gentlemen, but sitting on this jury will be one of the most important experiences in your lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, the only issue before you is whether or not the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt every element of the charges against Donald Bull. Ladies and gentlemen, it has not because it cannot. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is the hardest standard that there is in the law, and the state has this high burden. In the law, there are three types of standards, standards for proof. And the first one is preponderance, and that's used in civil cases. If I am the scales of justice, in a preponderance case, like in a car accident case, the scales just have to be tipped slightly over 51% to find for the party. The next level or the next burden of proof, clear and convincing standard, which is used in such cases as juvenile cases or termination of parental rights. That is the next level, and in criminal cases, it is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a heavy burden that the state has to bear in this case. Mr. Bull sits before you as an innocent man. Judge Henderson told you that in the void ear, and he has been an innocent man throughout the course of these proceedings. He remains one. And not saying that is just enough. It means something. It is the principle of American law, which is a cornerstone of all of our freedoms. And you, ladies and gentlemen, give it meaning. You will be instructed by Judge Henderson as to its importance. And ladies and gentlemen, you cannot take away Mr. Bull's presumption of innocence because the state has failed to meet its burden. As you all know, the burden of proof rests entirely on the state. We have no obligation whatsoever. We had no obligation to present evidence, but we did present evidence, and we will discuss that later on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this case is about evidence, not emotions. This is a court of law, and the law must be followed. We have a very tragic situation here. Everyone, everyone feels badly about the loss of these two people. And Judge Henderson will instruct you not to be swayed not to be influenced by sentiment, sympathy, or passion. Judge Henderson will also instruct you as to what we lawyers say is not evidence, and what you remember is the important fact here, and what we lawyers are trying to do is to try to summarize and analyze the evidence, and try to bring out points that we think is important for you to try to remember and discuss when you go back and deliberate. Look at the evidence. We have had 11 days of testimony. We have had over 80 witnesses come before you. And that is a lot to weigh. That is a lot to figure out. And I know some of you have been taking notes, but if you're like me, early on you will take notes a lot and then fall off later. Um, that is the way it is. And when I was working on my closing argument, I was trying to break the evidence down into areas that I will discuss with you. And Miss McMillan will discuss other areas with you. And she will follow behind me to further speak on behalf of Mr. Bull. Eight areas I will be discussing with you this afternoon. The first one is the cause of death, and I believe that is the most important one here, because it is a murder case, and if we don't have a cause of death, how can we have a murder case? Secondly, informants, 
In this case, the state's case rests on the words of two convicts, and we'll discuss in detail their testimony, their background, their motivation a lot. Third issue I will talk about is the ring. Fourth will be the police. Fifth will be about sexual relations between Mr. Bull and Miss Tompkins. Sixth will be Mr. Bull's associates. Seventh will be the fire scene. And eighth will be David Haynes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a reasonable doubt in any one of these eight areas, then you will have to find Mr. Bull not guilty because a reasonable doubt exists. First, cause of death. How can you have a murder case if the state's doctor cannot determine a cause of death? I ask you to remember back Dr. Murphy's testimony both in direct examination by the state and the cross-examination by the defense. Mr. Murphy stated in direct, quote, I cannot say why these two individuals died, end quote. And in cross, quote, I do not know what caused their death, end quote. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, there are other similar statements made by this witness before you. So what does he do next? He takes off, pure speculation, guesswork, conjecture, with no physical findings whatsoever, none, and talks about, quote, probable cause of death being asphyxiation. And then he describes it as being either strangulation or suffocation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is simply unbelievable because there is no, I repeat, no physical evidence supporting the doctor's position. And the only evidence for that is out of Chris Chester's mouth, and we'll talk about that later. I ask you to look at the indictments when they are given to you to go back when you deliberate. Judge Henderson will give you the indictments because in the indictments, it is specifically alleged that Mr. Bull, quote, manually or mechanically asphyxiated either Donna Tompkins or Justine Tompkins. There is no evidence for that. I ask you to remember back. It is so hard. All these days run together. But in the cross-examination of Dr. Murphy, he was asked specifically about factors which determine or show strangulation or suffocation. He was specifically asked about the fracture of the thyroid cartilage, fracture of the hyoid, H-Y-O-I-D, bone, contrusions of the strap muscles, pectichial hemorrhages, not just on the surface. That was a given. Both doctors talked about that. Both pectichial hemorrhages or bleeding on the internal organs, which is a key in strangulation cases. Contusions of the larynx, hemorrhages of the mucus, cuts, abrasions, marks on the tongue, similar marks, cuts, abrasions on the cheek. All those, ladies and gentlemen, are indications that a person had been strangulated or suffocated in some manner. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no evidence of that or of any of those points in this case on either one of the parties. Nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, without a single shred of physical or pathological evidence, Dr. Murphy jumps to the conclusion, makes the quote, unquote, probable findings or cause of death, which fits neatly within the indictment for the state. It is nothing more than a guess. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I ask you, we ask you to compare Dr. Murphy's testimony with the testimony of Dr. Jones. And ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jones was an impressive witness. Her experience. I'm not going to bore you with her experience. You remember that. She just testified two days ago. Her education, her experience. She is a deputy coroner in Cook County. She sees everything. She sees it on a daily basis. She has done, worked with, conducted over 6,500 autopsies and examinations, either doing them herself or supervising or reviewing. She, ladies and gentlemen, is a forensic pathologist, and that is an important factor here. She is not just a hospital pathologist as Dr. Murphy is. She is a forensic pathologist specifically trained, and it is her job, her duty, her profession to look for cause and manner of death. And that is very important in this case, ladies and gentlemen, because that is her specialization. That is what she has been trained to do. That is what she has experienced over her years of being a forensic pathologist. And that was what was needed to be done in this case to determine cause and manner of death. I also think it is critical. There is always allegations in cases about experts being hired guns or paid to testify or whatever the circumstance as they try to think that they may be biased one way or the other. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Dr. Jones would not put her professional reputation on the line if she did not believe in supporting evidence that she found in the autopsy as to her position. In fact, she testified this was only the third time, third time that she has ever testified for a criminal defendant out of over 400 times testifying in court. And ladies and gentlemen, that means hundreds of times testifying for the state's attorney up in Cook County. Dr. Jones was right on when she described the autopsy performed on Justine and Donna Tompkins as quote unquote incomplete. And ladies and gentlemen, you knew those autopsies were incomplete after Dr. Murphy testified because of the things he didn't do that he should have done. Asking Dr. Jones about what could have been done to see if these people had been strangled or suffocated, a number of things. You remember what she said about a complete examination, what has to be done in her job. It needs to be done right. Removing and examining a thorough examination of the body cavities for hemorrhages, checking the mouth in great detail to check for things. Also remember, when she was asked about someone attempting to smother or suffocate with the hands in such a fashion like that and the thumbs down, according to Dr. Jones, there would have been physical evidence present to show that occurred. Cuts in the tongue, cheek, mouth, and again, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing. There is nothing in this case, no physical, pathological evidence to show any type of smothering, strangulation, or suffocation. No evidence whatsoever. And again, that's what Dr. Murphy said in cross-examination. There wasn't anything there. She disagreed with other findings of Dr. Murphy. And she told you why, about Dr. Murphy's attempt to determine time of death by comparing the eye fluid, virtuous fluids, and blood alcohol. She told you this couldn't be done and reasons why. She talked about carbon monoxide in comparisons. She discussed that. She also told you that there was no physical evidence in the autopsy of any type of sexual assault of Donald Tompkins. And she did have the opinion as to the cause of death based upon a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to both individuals as inhalation of superheated air in a fire. She backed that up, ladies and gentlemen. She backed that up with the physical findings from the autopsy, which made her opinion consistent with the findings in the autopsy. When you go back, you will have an opportunity to review these photographs. These are not easy to look at, but they are there. It is your duty as a juror to do it. The one term she used, and I asked her to repeat it because I didn't understand it, is the, quote, foam cone coming out of the picture of the little girl. That is one of the factors that can indicate the cause of death as she described. And it is, ladies and gentlemen, very interesting to note that Dr. Murphy had no comment, no explanation, no reason to you whatsoever as to why that was the way it was with the little girl. Dr. Jones did because she is more experienced and as I said, forensic pathologists better able to explain the things, the circumstances to you. And she also testified besides doing the autopsies, she has reviewed reports, other medical findings and come up with the cause of death previously as she has here. She also talked about carbon monoxide level, the color of the tissue in the bodies, cherry red and some other talked about the irritation in the trachea area. She explained that in great detail under rigorous cross-examination by the state, and she held her ground because she was right. Ladies and gentlemen, the state does not know how these people died. That is something they must be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, not guess, not speculation, or say probably. We attempted to show you what could have been done and what should have been done to determine cause of death. Dr. Jones's testimony is in direct conflict with that of Dr. Murphy's. That is reasonable doubt. And because there is a reasonable doubt as to the cause of death, you must acquit and find Mr. Bull not guilty. Second subject area, informants. Christopher Chester, Harold Crozer. Ladies and gentlemen, the state's case rests on the testimony of these two individuals, and neither one of them can be believed. Chris Chester. Chris Chester was sent, sent directed by the authorities, by the police, to try and get something on Mr. Bull in the spring of 94. Do you remember on cross-examination, Mr. Chester talked about telephone conversation with Sergeant Ayers from the Canton Police Department in March of 1994, when his first words to the detective were, quote, Hey, so are you ready to go to the parole board for me or what? End quote. He wanted something. He 
you had to give something in return, and he did. A nonsense story about what Mr. Bull allegedly told him. Let's look at Chris Chester, a multi-convicted felon, convicted of armed robbery, forgery, aggravated battery, and felony criminal damage to property, and presently in the Illinois Department of Corrections. And he's there on a sweetheart deal that he got in January of this year with the Fulton County State's Attorney for only three years with another felony being dismissed. Ladies and gentlemen, State chose this witness. He is theirs. They picked him out. They wanted him. It was their decision to use him and no one else's. He was on a mission for the police. But what did he say anyway? Not very much. But he was the only state's witness who alleged that Mr. Bull confided in him to say something to the effect that Mr. Bull came to on top of Donna Tompkins with his hands over her mouth leaning on her. And he demonstrated that to us. He also said that Mr. Bull had done that to the little girl. He also said that he had lit the place on fire with a lighter. Ladies and gentlemen, it is simply not supported by the physical autopsy evidence. Would you confide in Mr. Chester? Would anyone confide in Mr. Chester? No. It makes no sense. He's got a mission. He has got a motive. He's got a purpose. He has given the state what they wanted. Harold Crozer is another interesting character. Here is an informant that told you all that Mr. Bull and Mr. Price had gone over to Donna Tompkins' apartment shortly after her death. Here is an informant that told you all that Mr. Bull and Mr. Price had gone over to Donna Tompkins' apartment shortly after her death, and then an auxiliary police officer ran them off. Do you remember that? Asked him a couple times about that. He also told that to police officers at least two times. He admitted that on the stand, and he said that he was sure of that, as he was as sure of the rest of his testimony. And ladies and gentlemen, you know for a fact that that is not true. Why? Two reasons. One, the auxiliary officers. We had a parade of auxiliary officers here early on, and some of her basic questions and only questions to them were the fact, did they chase anybody off or anybody try to come on the property or anything to that effect? No. You heard from all of the officers that that simply is not true. Nothing like that occurred. Secondly, There was no testimony from Mike Price to that effect when he testified before. If that had happened, don't you believe the state would have brought that out of him? It didn't. What does this mean? Simply that Harold Crozer cannot be believed. He is caught in a lie. Other reasons to doubt his credibility, his felony convictions. Look at those. Armed violence, criminal drug conspiracy, obstructing justice, unlawful delivery of a controlled substance. He might have had more but he had a good deal worked out for him in 1993. Do you remember I asked whether or not prior to the spring of 93, he was admitted to the Illinois Department of Corrections and his answer was yes. Asked if he wanted to go back. What is he going to say? No, he didn't want to go back. What happened? In 1993, he made a deal and he didn't go back. He created a story, got him a great deal. A short time thereafter, he got two felonies dismissed outright. A DUI, and other traffic cases dismissed for a plea on a simpler misdemeanor battery. He didn't go back to prison. He told the state what they wanted to hear, and to further help himself and to further integrate himself with the authorities. On April 1st, he came before you and told you something that he had never discussed with the police. And he had discussed with the police, as he said, on various things and various times. We know at least three times. Three meetings with the police in 1993 and 1994. The new evidence? Excuse me. His new statement. His statement was that Mr. Bull was worried about something at Rochelle Hillmeyer's house. Namely, a ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not believable because it is not true. He had never said that before to authorities, and he was creating this new statement that had not existed before April 1st, 1996. Believe me, if the police were talking to Mr. Crozier three times, trying to get all kinds of things on Mr. Bull, it is not something that Mr. Crozier would forget. It is something, however, that he would create to try to make him in a better light. All right, now for either one of these characters. The question that is presented is where is the wire? Where is the overhear? Where is the device commonly used by law enforcement officials when they want to get a statement from someone, when they don't want them to know that they are talking to the police? We don't have that here. With the wire overhear, some type of body recording device, There is no dispute as to what is said or not said. Here there is no control. 
No reliability when the informant is the sole source of the information. Again, Chris Chester was sent to get information from Mr. Bull. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a right way and there is a wrong way to do this type of thing, this type of work with an informant. And here you have an example of the wrong way. And again, there is reasonable doubt as to what Chris Chester and Harold Crozer said, so you must find Donald Bull not guilty. The ring, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of things appear to be the same, but are not the same. Appearances can be and are deceiving. Think about your own life experiences where you thought that something either was or wasn't, and then later on you realized it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a murder case, and a lot of people have many reasons to want something to happen, or to want something to be what it isn't. Miss Tompkins' sisters testified as if they were on a mission. They want someone to pay for the loss of their sister. They want that someone to be Mr. Bull. Ladies and gentlemen, neither sister told you what the center stone of her sister's ring was. And this was the ring that Donna had for at least 14 years. It was their testimony that Donna had received the ring in approximately 1979, so she had it for a considerable length of time. Common sense tells you that Donna would have told her sisters what that center stone was. It does not make sense that she would be describing this ring as, quote, my oval white stone ring, end quote. So what do we have here? We have testimony from Joanne Folk, who has known, had known Donna since 1988, and her testimony was that she worked eight feet away from Donna. Joanne Folk's birthday was in October, so she knew that her birthstone was opal. She testified before you that she goes to jewelry stores all the time goes to jewelry departments and other stores, and specifically looks, shops, or tries to find opals. She said she had looked at Donna's ring when Donna took it off, and Donna had shown it to her all the time, on a daily basis, and this is approximately four years. Joanne Folk was very specific about knowing opals, and that Donna's ring was an opal. She was sure that Donna was wearing her opal ring on 111.93. She was positive of that, no doubt whatsoever in her mind. And ladies and gentlemen, she identified State's Exhibit Number 62 as Donna Tompkins' ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not Donna Tompkins' ring. If we learned one thing from Mr. Ricketts, the jeweler, we learned that this exhibit, State's Exhibit Number 62, was not and is not an opal ring. I ask you to remember back when he's sitting up there, and I'm over here standing to talk to him about jewelry and examinations and about the ring in question here, when he has it up there looking at it. Remember his unsolicited response in cross-examination, which was crystal clear that this is not an opal ring. He could tell you what it is not, and it is not an opal. Mr. Ricketts did not, as counsel boldly stated in opening statement, say that this exhibit was the exact same ring as in the picture. He could not definitely say it was the same ring. He could not even put a percentage on whether or not it was the same ring. He also said he could make a zillion just like it if he had the stones to do it. The ring in the picture was consistent with the ring, but he was not 100% sure. Jennifer McMillan testified as to the ring, but remember, she had been shown the ring, excuse me, this ring, Exhibit 62, only a few short, well, two weeks before March 12, 1996, at the Kenton Police Station. She remembered Donna's ring from her teller experience with Donna and called the stone Opal. Terry Haynes said it was the same ring, but had no specifics. John Tompkins, Donna's husband, could not identify the ring as being Donna's. Ladies and gentlemen, Donna Tompkins did take her rings and watch off at night as exhibited by the signet ring and the watch, which were found as evidence on the kitchen counter. It appears that the state's position is that Donald Bull took Donna Tompkins' ring as some type of morbid souvenir, and ladies and gentlemen, this is ridiculous. Mr. Bull were to have done this, why wouldn't he have taken the signet ring also? Mr. Danner brought that up this morning. There is no reason not to, ladies and gentlemen. Killers don't believe that they will be caught. Just because their initials are on the ring don't mean anything. The real question, ladies and gentlemen, was Donna Tompkins' ring lost in the debris? And we will never know. And again, just because Donald Bull has a ring that looks like Donald Tompkins' ring does not mean that he is a murderer. He collects rings, as shown to you in other exhibits. These exhibits are introduced as defendants number 14 and defendants number 15. These were in the police custody and they were introduced through us because we thought it was important that you see them and I ask you to call your attention to defendants number 15 
which is a ring which has a date and is unique. Remember, Sergeant Ayers was asked if he had evidence that Donald Bull found rings and couches and kept them. The sergeant admitted that someone had told him that, but according to the chief investigator in this case, quote, someone telling me isn't evidence to me, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, State's Exhibit Number 62 is not an opal ring as witnesses have testified. Donna's ring was, therefore, a reasonable doubt exists, and you must find Mr. Bull not guilty. Next subject area, the police. Ladies and gentlemen, police on March 25th, 1993 were sure careful to get Mr. Bull to initial in four places and sign his name waiving any rights to talk to the police on that particular date. There are two exhibits here, People's Number 73 and People's Number 74, that you will be able to take back with you in review. They were very careful about that because the police wanted to talk to Mr. Bull and they had an express purpose to do that. They wanted to get information about a case, not just any case, but a double death case. A case where a mother and her young daughter were found dead in a fire. So why signing these particular forms are important? Show that Mr. Bull willingly and voluntarily spoke to them, and again. So how do the police interview Mr. Bull? As we brought out earlier, there are various ways to do that. Through a videotape, records everything, people's demeanor, people's actions, people's exact words, facial expressions, etc, etc. Excuse me, even audio tape, which gets the tone, infliction, and exact words used by the people. And again, ladies and gentlemen, the officer testified that they had access to that on that date, or the police write out a statement, type it out, and have the person sign it and initial it. Similar to this type of situation here, or they have the person write out the statement in their own words, or in their own handwriting, and then sign it. That wasn't done on the 25th. It wasn't done on any other occasion whatsoever. And what would have been so hard to have the interview taped, or at least have Mr. Bull sign the statement? Nothing. Except it allows the police to shape the evidence the way they want it. Slight alterations will do. It lets them be creative as the way they have done things here. And Miss McMillan will speak more on that later. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no notes whatsoever from the police of the interview of Mr. Bull. That, in and of itself, creates reasonable doubt. The police do have a bias. They do have interests. And yes, their motive are suspect because they are looking for a conviction. Just think of yesterday. Yesterday, Sarah Haynes was testifying on cross-examination for Miss McMillan about a statement of the police officer. She said something to the effect that the police, quote, may have written down something, but it is not what I said, end quote. One question presented you might be thinking about is why not or why didn't Mr. Bull Tell the police he had sex with Donna Tompkins. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because Donald Bull is not the type of person that trusts the police. And there is good reason for that, as we have seen in this case. Ladies and gentlemen, there is reasonable doubt as to the police allegations of what Mr. Bull said. And because of that, you must find him not guilty. Going to the next area, States Exhibit 76. You have all had a chance to see this. You have all had a chance to read it. It's been read to you again today. What is it? What it is is a letter from Mr. Bull to his friend, Mike Price. Yes, it is crude, but it is open and honest. When Mr. Bull wrote it, there was no promise it would be turned over to the police. It is not a statement to any detective, police officer, whomever. It is a letter to his friend. There is no guarantees that it will be forwarded to authorities. It is simply a statement to his friend telling him of the situation that he was in. And Mike Price voluntarily gave this letter to the police. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were falsely accused of a crime, wouldn't you protest it? I think we all would. And we all have our own way of doing it. This is Donald Bull's way. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Bull had sex with Donna Tompkins. He admitted that in the letter. That's what is true. 
We know for a fact that Donald said he sold Donna Tompkins the couch in October of 1992 after talks at Barbecue Roundup. We know from Iona Price that each found the other attractive. Mike Price said that they had met each other at the Price's house. We know Donna Tompkins called Wright's Furniture on December 22, 1992 from Connecticut where Mr. Bull worked to talk to him. We know that Donna Tompkins had an unlisted phone number. We know that Donna Bull had her unlisted phone number. The DNA stuff. Miss McMillan will talk about it. I understand that from the testimony from every DNA person that DNA cannot tell when intercourse took place. As the state witnesses, Mr. Murphy and Miss Hahn's testimony, we believe supports Mr. Bull's position just as he wrote in this letter back in 1993. Dr. Murphy's testimony was about semen being found approximately 72 hours prior to autopsy. This goes back to the early morning hours of January 11. Ms. Hahn's testimony goes back 48 hours before Wednesday morning, the time of the death. Both are consistent with Mr. Bull having sexual relations with Donna Tompkins in the early morning hours of Monday, January 11, 1993. Furthermore, we have the testimony of Dr. Ph.D. geneticist Ronald Ostrowski, who stated that his readings show semen being found up to five to six days after intercourse. Chris Chester is the only state's witness that even slightly hints at some type of sexual assault. And ladies and gentlemen, you know he is not credible. And no DNA finding to support sexual assault. No pathological or physical findings to support that. No findings of any type that point to a sexual assault other than the comments of Chris Chester. Ladies and gentlemen, there is reasonable doubt as to any sexual assault in this case and as to the time of intercourse and therefore you must find Mr. Bull not guilty. Next area, as I call it, Mr. Bull's associates. Rochelle Hillmeyer was the woman he was living with in the beginning of January of 1993. She testified and told you that when Mr. Bull returned to the home on January 13, 93, he did not smell of gasoline. He did not smell of smoke. His hair wasn't burned or singed. The clothes weren't burnt and there was no evidence of any fire, smoke, physical thing whatsoever. There was her testimony that his hair was wet and the testimony was that it was wet. I do not recall her statements as to it was washed. Mr. Danner's assertion that Mr. Bull washed his hair at Donna Tompkins and then came to Rochelle Hillmeyer's house is interesting because that puts Mr. Bull in the middle of a smoldering fire. On April 4th of 1996, Mr. Bull's hair was wet. It could have been from sweat. Rochelle also told you that Mr. Bull was upset with Mike Price for the way that Price was talking about the condition of Donna Tompkins' body. Donna Bull was concerned and stated that the fire was tragic and that a small child was killed. Rochelle Hillmeyer had no testimony whatsoever as to the whereabouts of Mr. Bull the weekend before the fire. You don't know where he was during that weekend. Other members of her family testified as Misty Harbor, her daughter, testified as to Mr. Bull coming in when he came in that morning. Also, it was interesting, on cross, she made a comment about the cops, quote, made a few mistakes in my statement, end quote. Eric Pig testified about watching TV with Mr. Bull and they were all interested in the fire because it was right down the street from them. Brile Clear testified, and it is not clear as to what he said about some context of Mr. Bull saying the police don't have anything on him. Mike Price testified, nothing much said except that Mr. Bull said he wanted to have sex with Donna, and that was back in the fall when he said that. He, Mike Price, also said that Donna Tompkins was a friend and co-worker with his wife, Iona. Iona testified Donna Tompkins and Donald Bull being attracted to each other, and that Donna called Mr. Bull from out east around Christmas time and talked about her outside life, smoking, drinking, and relationship with men. There is testimony from a Joanne Wright talking about Mr. Bull being out in a public place in a bar by a bartender with others present, something about the state, and trying to connect with this case, which there is no connection. The last two witnesses in this area I want to talk about are Jacqueline Day and David Nell. Jacqueline Day, on January 13, 1993, she was upset that morning, ladies and gentlemen. She was going to take her car away from her daughter because Mr. Bull was using it. She didn't like Mr. Bull, if you noticed that. She said that the car was by the dairy. Remember her cross-examination, ladies and gentlemen? She said she drove past the car, backed up, got out of the car, went to look at the car, looked at the tires, looked at the driver's side, looked at the passenger's side, didn't see anybody in the car, thought it was unusual, 
thought this was different. She was concerned. So does she bring this up with her daughter that morning as to how concerned she was or where the car was? No evidence showing that conversation whatsoever. Nothing. Jacqueline Day talked to the police on March 25th, 1993 and did not mention anything about a car being at a dairy. She talked to the police about driving in a completely different area on March 25th, 1993. And she talked to them for some length of time. She volunteered nothing about the car being at the dairy. Three years later, she testified the way she did. She has a motive and she has got an ax to grind. Her testimony is not credible, ladies and gentlemen. David Nell. Who knows what is the truth from his mouth? His situation is interesting to look at, and why? Because it shows how the police could twist things around. We know that on March 26, 1993, David Nell was interviewed by two police officers, Ken Kedzer and Marty Bowden. Is there any mention of the defendant Bull driving by Donna Tompkins' apartment? No. Was there any mention of Donald Bull saying he wanted to have sex with Donna Tompkins that morning? No, nothing. Now, four days later, there is a follow-up, and this follow-up, this interview, consisted of an hour and ten-minute interview of David Nell by the state police officer and David Ayers, the investigator from the Canton Police Department. At this hour and ten-minute interview, was there any mention of Donald Bull driving by Donna Tompkins' apartment? No. No mention of Donald Bull or David Nell driving by her apartment or saying he wanted to have sex with her on those morning hours of the 13th of January, 1993. Now we go to March 11, 1994, almost a full year later. What happens? Authorities bring in a hotshot ATF person, interviewing expert. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this expert had not, repeat, not read the March 30th, 1993 follow-up report. This expert came in with a reason, or a purpose, to get David Nell to say what they wanted him to say. This expert talked to David Nell for 30 minutes in the car, and now the state had what it wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing said by the associates of Mr. Bull presents sufficient evidence to show other than he was drinking the night of January 12, 1993 and in the early morning hours of the 13th and had to sleep it off after getting a flat tire. Ladies and gentlemen, there is reasonable doubt. You must find Donald Bull not guilty. Fire scene. Ladies and gentlemen, this fire was done by an arson. Arsonist, I am sorry. This is clear. There is no dispute as to that. This fire had accelerant used in this, and this fire was a hot, fast fire. Hot, intense fire. Why do you think they use the term accelerant? Makes it that way. The question never answered or discussed by the state. Where did this stuff come from? Where does the gasoline, where does this heavy petroleum distillant come from? We have no idea, because there has been nothing shown. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not a slow, smoldering fire. The three witnesses I want to speak briefly about. One is the investigator Stanko. Ladies and gentlemen, you only have part of the picture and part of the pictures from Mr. Stanko's initial testimony to you. It is only later, when he is called by the defense, that you will get a chance to see all the pictures from the fire scene. Why did he only give you part of the pictures? I don't know. And then the question must be asked is why did he exclude in this book all of the pictures that were taken of glass from the doorway? All the small pictures, the individual pictures. When asked on examination about what pictures showed glass, he mentioned four numbers when he had this book. Numbers 38, 39, 71, and 114. I ask you to look through that. There are no individual pictures of glass in this entire book. Those particular scenes are just big area scenes, and you will get a chance to see that. None showed individual glass. When you get a chance to look at it all, when you get a chance to look at all the pictures, ladies and gentlemen, from the fire scene, look at pictures 165, 166, 167, 168, 171. They are all in a series, but they are all left out of this. They show individual glass with descriptions, which is consistent with the theory that has been presented by the defense in this case as to the nature and type of fire and how the fire started. Look at the pictures, please. March 28, 1993, Mr. Stenko called the fire, quote, an intense fire which occurred during a relatively short duration, end quote. Ted Anderson, on April 2, 1996, indicated that the fire was, quote, a rapid intense fire, end quote. Then, April 4, 1996, after David Haynes testified, was called by the defense as an adverse witness. Ted Anderson stated that the fire in the bed essentially smoldered out, end quote, it was a smoldering state, end quote. 
until David Haynes opened the door. When Mr. Anderson was asked to show in any of his 31 pages of report this new, and I mean new, theory of, quote, smoldering state, end quote, it wasn't in there. Pat Burns testified for the defense, certainly an interesting person, and ladies and gentlemen, this was the first time that Mr. Burns had ever testified for a criminal defendant in a case. He testified over a hundred times. In his expert opinion, three important factors came out. First, that the fire was a very rapid and intense fire that burned very quickly. Second, that this was not, I repeat, not a smoldering fire. Third, that there was a single point of origin, which he believed to be the area of exit by the door, and that there was a trail connecting it to the bed. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing as far as the arson investigators connect Donald Bull to this fire. Again, only Christopher Chester does that, the state's informant. The state's attempt to ultra-modify its opinions regarding the origin and nature of the fire is such where reasonable doubt has been created. Also the fact that nothing other than Chris Chester ties Donald Bull to the fire scene creates reasonable doubt, and because of that, you must find Donald Bull not guilty. Lastly, Mr. Haynes, David Haynes. What he told investigators on January 13th, 1983, could not have happened, simply could not have happened. And he has been changing his story, or even the state has been changing its story to suit him ever since. Miss McMillan will detail this for you. The state has failed to do what it promised to do. That is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the guilt of Mr. Bull. Mr. Bull sits before you as an innocent man. As you go back to begin your deliberations, he remains an innocent man. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bull asks you to do what the law requires you to do in this case. Find the state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt and return a not guilty verdict on all counts. Thank you very much. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Spoon River God. Gothic is a production of Lone Bird Media in association with CZ Studio and Radio Verite. The show is produced by August Olson, editing, directing, and producing by Corey Zimmerman, audio mastering and engineering by E. Mastered. Research is done by Anne Marie Cannon, Chelsea Mesa, and me, Jinra Illustrissimo. Spoon River Gothic is written and hosted by Corey Zimmerman. You can follow the show at czstudio.works and read the blog at spoonrivergothic.com. Show some love by leaving us a rating or a review on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And stay tuned for the next episode as we dive deeper into the Donald Bull case. Thank you for listening. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide.